Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming for today. We are going uh, to talk about uh, today. We are going to talk about sports analytics. How analytics is uh, working at sports and how it uses sports. I am Abed Mandoyan. I came here from Armenia, from American University of Armenia. I am a data science program chair there. Uh, I am a very uh, long time uh, Lazio fan. Does anyone know uh, about this team from Rome? Yes. Uh, I started cheering for Lazio starting from 1994. And uh, in this picture, you actually can see uh, the whole Lazio, commun Lazio fans community of Armenia, like two of us. And uh, this is the game that happened uh, a few years ago uh, f between Lazio and Roma. So it is a super, it's a Italian Cup uh, game when first time these two teams, uh, the rival teams met together and Lazio won. Actually, I couldn't go there to watch the game, but as you can see, I was there uh, presented with my photo. So this is the only time I was in the stadium, but still I'm a big uh, fan of Lazio. So I am a big fan of football, I'm a big fan of sports, and I have a big passion for data analytics. So that's why I started using all that I know in data, in data science and data analytics in sports to better understand the sports. Now, uh, how many of you here are football fans, the European football fans? Yes. How many of you are uh, basketball fans? Baseball? American football? Cricket? Australian football? OK, so uh, we are going to talk today about four major uh, team sports. I mean, when I say the major, I usually mean that these are the four sports that I do follow, so I am most interested in, interested in. that's why uh, I like talking about them. And also we are going to look at how is uh, the sports used in these four games, right? Uh, the analytics used for these four games. Now we say that uh, the analytics, sports analytics is used uh, in, sp uh, in sports for two major domains. The first one is betting market, uh, when people are trying to uh, make predictions about the outcome of the certain sport uh, event, and they are trying to make some money on it. Now, the betting market uh, can be divided into betting with bookies, when people are just uh, doing, uh, putting their money on some event, or it's about going to be about the daily fantasy sports or fantasy sport in general. But the most interesting and important part here is uh, how the analytics can help the teams actually to uh, thrive and to do better. Now here we are, uh, how it is used for the teams is that it's used to make the teams playing better, uh, like giving advices on what the strategy should be, what, uh, what player need to be on the pitch and so on. Uh, it is used to make the game better. When we say make the game better, we mean that uh, here analytics is trying to kind of um, uh, get the new measures uh, that will um, show how the game is developing, trying to invent new rules for the game and make game more interesting and more entertainment for us. Now, uh, it is highly, highly used for the scouting. Uh, you know, we know that, and you know that, uh, for example, in football, the transfer market is maybe one of the least efficient things that is possible, right? We can see signings of the players for $100 million, then suddenly they stop to play. Now, uh, it is used to uh, make better decision in scouting areas, so get uh, talent uh, for cheaper price and then being able to sell it with a higher price. And for sure, it is used to increase the revenues. Now, uh, uh, there are two main web pages that uh, I will strongly recommend you to follow if you are interested in uh, sports analytics. One of them is MIT Sloan Business School's uh, Sports Analytics Conference. Now, it is organized once a year, and uh, mostly students all over the US coming together uh, to show their ideas on how analytics can be used on sports. So if you are interested to see uh, what kind of developments are there uh, in the world in the uh, field of sports analytics, you need to follow them. The second one is a sports analytics world series. These are uh, 
conference series that are happening several times per year. So again, they are publishing very good papers. And in both cases, there is a very strong link between industry and academia. So it's not like uh, someone uh, is doing research on, our, on their own, but uh, they are doing the research exactly for the industry. Uh, I didn't want to talk uh, a lot about the betting part. However, you need to know that the betting market is uh, one of the markets is driving actually uh, sports analytics ahead. Now, if you go and uh, try to find this book that is called The Smart Money, How the World's Best Sports Better Beat the Bookie Out of Millions by Michael Connick. Now, this is a biographical book that is showing how uh, several people at the end of 90s, uh, they got this formula or algorithm of predicting the American football and basketball games. Now they start to play in Las Vegas, they start to making odds, uh, and they actually did uh, good money on it. Uh, but the thing is that uh, at the end, the author, uh, Michael Connick, who was part of that team, he's uh, writing a sentence about the fact that now when everyone knows that they are beating the bookies, and uh, he's very afraid that at some point of time, the people from Vegas will come and break his legs, something like that. So uh, it's really happened, but uh, I will not uh, suggest you to um, go that much into this direction, into betting direction, but to think about uh, how uh, analytics can be used in general in sports. But if you are interested in how it is working in betting, here is like a very simple example. Let's say uh, we have the following two teams, like uh, Paris Saint-Germain is playing against uh, Cayenne, two French teams. And now you can see the coefficients that are given by the bookies is uh, for Paris Saint-Germain winning is 1.11, and for Cayenne winning is 20.47. Now, if you want to bet on which event will you bet here? Let's say you want to make a bet. Now, what will be your best guess or best decision on which team to bet? Paris Saint-Germain. Why? Now, Paris Saint-Germain has, yes, a higher chance to win, right? Correct? But its coefficient is also smaller, meaning that if you are betting on that event, you are going to make a very few money. Now, when uh, you are doing a betting, uh, when you're playing in the betting market, it means that you basically have some strategy or some algorithm that is going to predict uh, the probability of some event to happen. Let's say you are going to predict the probability that Paris Saint-Germain will win, or you are going to, and you're going to predict the probability that Cayenne will win, or even the draw. Now, the idea of uh, value betting uh, that is uh, used by uh, the people in this industry is that you don't need to uh, bet on the event that is ha has higher probability to happen, but you need to find the events where uh, the bookmakers actually are giving the wrong odds, or they have calculated the probabilities wrong. Let's take this following example. Uh, now, uh, if you take out the margin that bookmaker has, uh, you'll get the probabilities of the events to happen. So now bookmakers think that Paris Saint-Germain is going to win with the probability of 0.85, and Cayenne is going to uh, win with probability 0 0.05. So there is only 5% chance that Cayenne will win. However, your model and your prediction is showing that Cayenne, the probability that Cayenne will win is 0 0.15. Now, the uh, principles of value betting is saying that now you need to bet on Cayenne. Okay, because uh, the bookmaker by itself is giving lower probability of that event to happen than you in reality think that there is a probability of it to happen. So this is the basic idea of value betting. Now, why is this happening? Is that because when bookmakers are giving the odds, like 1.11 or 20.47, uh, these are a kind of proxies for the probabilities that bookmakers are attaching for each event. Now, uh, they give these odds taking into account not just uh, the probabilities of the event to happen, but they are also taking into account the market. Let's say if there are a lot of people who are betting on Paris Saint-Germain, then in order to hedge their risks, they are going to increase the uh, coefficient for Cayenne. So there will be more people now betting on Cayenne. So they'll get this kind of balanced uh, pool there. Uh, meaning that uh, they need to balance it. And when they are balancing it and taking into account the market 
forces, they are giving some different probabilities than the true probabilities of the events are happening. So the goal of the good betting strategy in this case is going to be to find the true probabilities of the events to happen and to understand in which events, in which cases can you get an edge over the uh, bookmaker. This is going to be all about the betting. Now uh, let's have a look at some major sports um, that are using uh, analytics. Uh, again, question who follows baseball? One, two, one. No? When I asked, several people raised their hands. Come on, baseball is a fun game. Now, what is fun? Yeah. What is fun with baseball and is that uh, actually there is no one in this world who knows all the rules. That's the saying in US, they are saying no one can know all the rules. Now, potentially there is no time limit on the game, so the game can last forever. It never happened, so it is usually done in two hours, three, sometimes in four, it happens as well. But usually it lasts like two and a half, three hours. Uh, what is fun, again, with baseball is that uh, during the regular season, uh, each team, this is about American Major League of Baseball, okay? Each team needs to play 162 games, but sometimes they play 160, sometimes they play 159, sometimes they play 158, and it depends on whether or not if the last games are not important to play in terms of who will get to playoffs, then they are just going to abolish it and do not play. Now, this might be sound a little strange, but uh, in football, uh, you can remember a lot of games, especially at the end of the season, these boring 0-0 games where 19 minutes, 22 people are not doing anything, just standing on the pitch, hope, hoping that sooner the game will end. Now, in baseball, this is not happening. If the game will not change anything, it is not played. Now, saying that uh, the first person who started uh, to bring analytics in baseball and sports, sports as well was a man named Henry Chadwick. So he's the first man who started to collect uh, the data called box score. Box score is an information about how the game has ended. Like in baseball, it can be how many runs was created, how many runs was allowed, what was the final score, who won, and so on. So this is how analytics started in uh, baseball. And then we got uh, this person named Bill James who was a uh, very big fan of baseball, and he, starting from 1977, he started publishing his uh, uh, baseball almanacs, uh, where he was doing his own research on the baseball. And uh, this uh, uh, research, or these reports, were not published by any big publishing house. He was publishing them by himself. So for, uh, for about 30 years, he was doing it by himself, and until he got uh, this recognition of a person who actually invented something that's called sabermetrics. Uh, sabermetrics is a term for uh, using data analytics in baseball. Uh, who knows what movie is this? Moneyball. Who has read the book? Yes, it's easier to watch the movie, right? Now, uh, uh, what is Moneyball about? Yes, everything here is about data science in sports. Anything else? Now, okay, Moneyball is about data science in sports. So now this is going to be about how a manager of a very average team, Oakland's A, a manager named Billy, uh, Billy Bean, he started to use analytical methods in order to find talents in the market. So they got this very small budget uh, of the wages to pay to the players. So they have decided they now they need uh, better players with the uh, smaller wages. Now, what they did actually uh, was nothing new in sabermetrics. What they have started doing there, uh, every, everybody knows that before, like starting from the founder of the sabermetrics 30 years before. But uh, if you remember the movie, the most important part there was that the manager by himself was very devoted to the analytics. So he starts saying that, you know, starting from now, we are going to do scouting based on the numbers rather than based on the uh, perception of the scouts. Uh, if you think that this is about data science, uh, in our present terms, what they did there will not be called data science at all because this is a very, very basic calculations. Uh, they might even use some linear, simple linear regressions at, uh, at most, right?
right? So there was like very basic calculations here, but because they were very much devoted uh, to using it, they were able to be successful. Now they were able to be successful and after uh, they got the success, uh, Paul de Podesta, a man who was helping uh, Billy Bean and he was played by Joan Hill in the movie. He moved to Los Angeles uh, Dodgers and become the general manager of it at age 31. He totally failed. Now, uh, Billy, uh, Bill James uh, becomes a barometric uh, advisor for the general manager of uh, Boston Red Sox. And he helped Boston Red Sox to win the title, the championship, first time in 68 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah, uh, 86 years. So Sabermetrics really helped them. However, because uh, all this stuff was very simple, sooner all the teams started to apply it. So uh, the Oakland A and other teams uh, would, to, did not have any kind of competitive advantage in using the, uh, the analytics here because everyone's starting to use it. Now, uh, the baseball is very rich with data and is uh, very easy to uh, analyze because in baseball, everything is very simple in reality, right? There is one batter and there is one pitcher. So whenever you are calculating statistics, you can calculate any statistics you want about pitcher A playing against batter A. Now, and because this statistic calculation of these statistics is easy, the statistics is also very much available. So that's av uh, availability of the data is what makes Cybermetrics so popular in the world and uh, in, in, in the US. And many people started just doing it for fun and then they start to do their analysis. So the data is vastly available. If you want to start with sports analytics and it's not like that you hate baseball, then you can start with baseball analytics. Now, there are several books that I will uh, definitely recommend you to read on this. The first one is uh, Moneyball. Trust me, it's different from the movie, so it's better to read. Uh, then we have here a book called Mathletics, uh, made, uh, written by Wayne Winston, and this is absolute must for anyone who wants uh, not just to get this for, into sports analytics, but wants to understand how to, uh, analytical methods need to be used in sports. And you don't need to be a data scientist in order to uh, be comfortable with the book. All you need is just very basic math skills. Then we have baseball, uh, uh, Analyzing Baseball with R and the Percentage Book by Tommy Tango. So if you're interested, these are the four books to start with. Basketball fans. Which team? Yeah. Okay, a little fan of which team? Yeah, not NBA. Those NBA guys there. Which one? Boston, okay. Now, uh, Greg Popovich. This is the guy who started actually the latest uh, uh, analytical revolution in basketball. Now, what he did, he started analyzing uh, at some point of the time uh, during his uh, tenure, during the mid-season, he understood that a lot of his players are getting injured. Injured, and he had a very short uh, bench, meaning that there were not that much of players to substitute the stars. So he started making analytics. He started using analytics to make his roster uh, working better. So which player need to play, which one need to rest, and he was doing this uh, so consistently that at some point of the time, uh, they went out for five or six away games, and all his star plays, uh, players were on the bench, not playing. Uh, because he knew that he was going to lose the game, but uh, the analytics were showing that it's okay to lose one or two or three games if you want to keep your stars in a good shape. Now, it intended with uh, NBA commissioner fining uh, the team, San Antonio Spurs, by 250,000 for just for showing a very boring game. The game was boring very much, however, it was purely based on the, uh, the choice there was purely based on the analytics. He needed stars uh, to rest. Now, even though with his analytical mind, Popovich went to win five NBA championships and six uh, conference titles while being with San Antonio Spurs, so it helped him. Now, uh, in NBA, uh, there was one innovation that just like changed everything. That was a sport view. Now, sport view are cameras that are installed on the NBA uh, court. 
and they are measuring the coordinates of the ball, X, Y, Z coordinates of the ball, and X and Y coordinates of the, each player on the uh, court. Now, the measurement is done 24 times per second. Now, then the data is uh, given to NBA teams, to all of them, so they can use it for analytics. Actually, the NBA is very open, the API is open, so if you are interested, you can get this data and analyze it uh, by yourself. Now, if in 2012, 2013, only 10 teams were using the sport view, now all the teams in NBA are using it, and they are making this data available for everyone. Uh, the API is available, you can easily find some documentation about it, and you can scrap the data by yourself and uh, do the analysis, any kind of analysis that you want uh, by yourself. Now, uh, if you are following the NBA, you can recall uh, what happens in the quarterfinals or uh, Western Conference Finals. There was a game between Golden State Warriors and Houston Rockets. And uh, the series ended with 4-3 with uh, Golden State War Warriors winning. And uh, uh, here, both teams were, are using analytics uh, very hardly and very much. So they are using analytics very much and they both have the strategy of uh, making three points shots. Now, you know that in basketball there are three-point shots, two-point shots, right? Now, in basketball they understood that uh, during the game each team has equal number of possessions. And the best thing the team can do is to squeeze as much as it is possible for uh, one possession. So usually uh, per one possession the team is making a point of about one or one uh, point or seven. Now, that's why they understood that it's going to be better to uh, for every time a team has having a possession, it's going to be better to understand what will be the expected points value of that possession. Let's, let's say in this case, uh, the game, the Leon, uh, Kawhi Leonard has the ball and he can either pass to Green, he can pass to Tim Duncan or can make a shot by himself and so on. Now for all this possible combination, they are calculating the probability of making a shot and what would be the actual uh, expected possession value. So how many points can you expect to get? Now by doing all this analysis, they come out with the uh, idea that it is always going to be better to make a three-point shot. Now here is a simple example of the heat map that you can see from the game Houston Rockets against New York Knicks. Now if you are looking here, you can see that mostly Houston Rockets is doing the three-point shots. Right, so they do understand that these are the parts from uh, around the paint where you can get uh, the most effective shots, while New York Knicks is doing mostly playing under the basket. So this was the strategy for both Houston Rockets and uh, Golden State Warriors. And if you look at the results of the latest season, you can see that most three-point shots were done by Houston Rockets. However, Golden State Warriors had the most effective was the most effective in making their three-point shots. So the three-point percentage for them was the highest. Uh, that's why actually the game was very tight. Uh, the series were very tight between these two teams and uh, eventually the one who was more effective in making three-point shots actually won. Then Warriors went to just crash Cavaliers on the final of the games by uh, winning against them by 4-0. Now, if you are interested uh, in what else in NBA people are paying attention, you can go to look at the hackathon.nba.com. NBA is organizing a data science hackathons uh, every year. Unfortunately, it's just for the students from the US, but you can look at what kind of problems they are trying to solve there. Now, they have two tracks. One is called analytics tracks. The other one is going to be called the business track. So once they are trying to understand how to make their team play better, and they want to understand how they can make, how they can make more money on the game by itself. Now, to look at the games, uh, at the books that uh, you would like to maybe read about the basketball analysts, I will uh, highly recommend you to start with the book re uh, written by De Dean Oliver called Basketball on Paper. Again, this is a very basic statistical analysis of the game without any machine learning data science and so on. You know what game is it? Football. Now, uh, apparently the analytics in football started from Dynamo Kiev. So Valery Lobanovsky and a scientist named Anatoly Zelensov, both of them, uh, Zelensov died if I'm not mistaken, several years ago. 
they started applying analytics method in Dynamo Kiev. And if I'm not mistaken, in Dynamo Kiev, they already have this R&D Institute of uh, Sports Analytics. So they pioneered it, they started it. Now, when they started it, uh, several teams uh, much later took the lead and start to uh, apply it. Now, does everyone remember what this team did? Leicester. They won Premier League out from nowhere. So no one was expecting that they are going to win and they won. Uh, when they won, uh, there was a lot of talks about why it happened, but the main thing we hear was that they had a very great team of scouts of people who are looking at the analytics, looking at the statistics, and trying to find the best players with the uh, possible lowest price. So that's how they find Mahrez, that's how they find Nagolo Kante. They took them from the lowest divisions in, in France, right? And when Leicester became the champion and uh, then miserably failed the next season, now no one tried to uh, invite Claudio Ranieri, who was the coach of the Leicester, because everyone knows that he's not going to win anything again. But instead, they started to hire all the analytical team of the Leicester, the people who were actually uh, able to find these talents there. Now, if you look at other teams or other sports venues, let's say, so Manchester City has a very good analytical team. Arsenal had a very good analytical team and had a very good uh, emphasis on analytics. Tottenham Hotspur. So Germans are using analytics for their uh, national team the last time they failed, but usually it is successful. Who is Arsenal fan here? Anyone? What do you think about this guy? He's a good coach, not the great. He was uh, the coach of your team for about 20 years. Yeah, you could say something better about him. Okay, whatever. Now, uh, Arsene Wenger was a coach of Arsenal for about 20 years, and at the very beginning, fans were just loving him. At the end, they were hating him. Uh, because Ars yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, at the very beginning, he was winning, but at the end, he starts not losing the games, but at the end, the goal for the Arsene Wenger changed. Now, uh, the team has a shareholders, the businessmen who own the team, and now they were saying, Arsene, that you know, we want a good team that will be maybe at the top of the Premier League. We don't necessarily want you to win the titles, uh, but we want to get a good stream of revenues and we want to make the profit. So that's how Arsene Wenger was managing his team. Arsenal by itself was very profitable. Arsenal by itself uh, was spending a, a very small amounts on the transfers and Wenger was always able to find a very good players out from nowhere for a very small price. Then on the peak of their career, when the analytical methods and data science were showing that, okay, you know, in one or two years, the, career, the performance of this player is going to go down, he was selling him. Now, the fans don't like to see the stars leaving their teams, and the fans want uh, their team to win the titles, right? They don't care about the money, they don't care about the revenues, about the profits, and so on. That's why at the, at the very end, they were starting to hate Arsene Wenger. But in reality, he is the person who brought analytics into Arsenal and he made Arsenal one of the greatest teams, in uh, my opinion. Who knows this guy? Paul. Now, Octopus Paul was so far, uh, the most successful, successful animal. Yes, successful. Uh, the most successful in predicting the football games. Now, if you look at these predictions, these are just the predictions for the uh, Germany games during the World Cups. He, he was wrong only twice. So this guy was the most successful one. And uh, if we go and look at other people trying to predict the games, like the Goldman Sachs. So these guys, they said that they did 10 million uh, or 1 million simulations for World Cup 2018. They applied artificial intelligence, machine learning, Monte Carlo simulations, and all that kind of fancy tools and stuffs. And they predicted that uh, there is going to be a final game between uh, Brazil and Germany, and Brazil is going to beat Germany. After several days, they start to predict that, no, you know, uh, it's going to England to be champion, then it's Belgium to be champion, then when the Belgium was lost, okay, most probably it's going to be Croatia. When Cro and 
finally they say, okay, it's France. Now, this was the prediction that they made, and uh, several other predictions, uh, they were there before the World Cup will look something like this. So Brazil, Germany, Spain, Germany, Brazil, Spain, so different rankings. Now, uh, this raised the question of whether or not it is possible at all to predict the football game result. And if we are uh, apl uh, applying all this AI stuff and we can't do even better than Octopus Poll is doing, so why to bother at all? And also it is raising another question, do we need to be able to predict the game result? Now, when the game results are very predictable, what happens with the game? It becomes boring. Now, when uh, in sports analytics there is a kind of uh, domain when uh, people are trying to understand which leagues are more appealing or more competitive. And in that case, to understand which leagues are more uh, appealing and competitive, you need to understand the leagues where the predictions are wrong the most time. So if it is hard to predict the game output, then that game is much more interesting for us, right? Now, uh, that's why when we're saying that, okay, let's employ analytics and help the team so it will be, uh, one team can employ analytics and become more predictable that the team will win. Now our question will be, why do we need it? On the other hand, we as a fans, we are not interested in the business aspect of the football, right? We, if we are, you are cheering for one, uh, let's say, team, you will be much more interested to see some uh, rich oil country or sheikh coming and buying that team and starting to pour the money there and getting all the stars because that's all you need. You, uh, you want to see your team winning. You are not interested in using, uh, in the team using analytics to increases revenues. Now, the same thing uh, has happened with the Arsenal. When uh, Wenger was using analytics to make its team Arsenal more efficient, and it was more efficient, but the fans started to hate it. And the same thing is happening when the new coach is coming and taking the team. Now, he can apply analytics and try to find undervalued players somewhere from the second divisions and so on, but he knows that the fans want the best players now. Because the fans want the best players now, they are standing, starting to they are starting to uh, spend a lot of money, millions on buying a new star players that are usually failing in one year and so on. Do you know one of that managers? You know Rafa Benitez? Heard about him? That was his strategy: he was coming, taking the team, buying all the stars at the very beginning. Then he will play one, two, three, four seasons, then nothing works, and he's going out. So now, uh, what I'm saying at the end, that if we want to see analytics used in the football, we need to treat it as being someone's business. So we need to understand it, that uh, the analytics is used to maximize some profit, to make it more effective, and not just uh, please us with uh, Ronaldo playing against Messi or them playing together in one team. Okay, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you.